from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Three, two, one, on rolling. Today is Saturday, March 9th, 2013. My name is Hassan Kwame Jeffries of The Ohio State University and the Southern Oral History Program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I'm with videographer Petna Dalico in Albany, Georgia, on the campus of Albany State University to conduct an interview for the Civil Rights History Project, which is a joint undertaking of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture and the Library of Congress. We are here uh, this afternoon uh, with Lucius Holloway Sr. Uh, and Emma Cape Holloway. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and for sharing uh, your story and the history of the movement with us. Thank you for having us. Mr. Holloway, where and when were you born? Uh, I was born in Terre County, Dawson, Georgia in 1932. And your parents, what, what, what were their names? Uh, my parents was, my father was Bobby Holloway Sr. and my mother was Louise Thornton Holloway. And what did, what did they do? Sharecroppers. So you grew up on the farm? Grew up on the farm, the hard way. The hard way? It was half cropping. They pay for all of the bills and at the end of the year they take that out and if anything was left you divide it, but it was never anything left. Mm -hmm. You always broke even. And life on the farm, so you, I mean, you grew up doing what, what kinds of things? With, with your dad, working in the field, I'm assuming? Right. Well, life on the farm, uh, back in, I would say at least 35, that would give me at least to be three years old and on up to 35, 6, and 37 during that time. Now, it was good because that's all I knew. So life was good. I had something to eat, a place to sleep, uh, and, and loving parents. So. If I look at it right then and, and forget about today, it was good. Because you know, that far back, out those privileges was, was just like inside today. Uh, old Sidon with catalog and all this, it was fine. But if I look at it then and forget today. Yeah. What was life like away from the farm in Terrell County? Well, that was not much of a life away from the farm because Terra County was so formative till even right up town south. So there was cotton and corn right up to the streets and, and mule stay was all around it. So you never got out of the mode of farming. It was farming everywhere you look. Even going to church once a month, you rode the wagon. So farming was, was embedded in you. That's all it was. That's all it was farming. So we had to like it. We was born in it. We was growing up in it, and it was good then, very good. Now, you eventually uh, will serve in the military, right? Uh, when did you, when did your service begin? Well, well my military service began in June of 19, 1952. That's when military time started, and and my only reason for going to the military because my parents, like I said, they worked most all their lives had farming, and they had very little or nothing, and it was a whole bunch of us. So that was one of my ways. In other words, I was hired out. Dad had somebody needed somebody to work, he hired me out. And I worked and I brought the check home. Well, they weren't, they weren't paying for no checks. Then they paid cash money in a brown envelope. So I brought that home. And to go to the military, to me, was a better way to help support my family. And I enlisted in, uh, I was sworn in June the 9th, June the 19th, 1952. And that, at that time, a private in the military was drawing $60 a month. Mm. So that was a big pile of money for me. And it was so large till when I went to, to talk about making allotment to my parents, I said to the recruiter, I wanted to send my mother an allotment. And of course, I couldn't, I had to send a class A, not a class Q. A class Q allotment during that time was when who you sent it to was a dependent of yours. My parents wasn't dependent on me, so I had to send a class A allotment. And that meant whatever I send, they didn't match it. So I was getting $60 a month, I sent mama 40. Mm -hmm. He said, you're crazy, how can you live out of $20 a month? I said, I can, and I did. Now it was during your time in the military, 
uh, that you met uh, the future Mrs. Mrs. Holloway. No, it was after, after my, it was after my okay. tenure. Uh, I met her in uh, uh, 1955 June, and I had never seen, never heard, never thought of her before the first day I saw her. But that's when I met her. About the last, of, I, I was discharged honorably June in 1955, and I got home. Could have been the 20th of June, and probably either the morning, the evening of the 20th, or the evening of the 21st of 55 when I met her. Mrs. Holloway, were you from Terrell County as well? Yes, I was. Born in, in, Born in Terrell County. And do you remember when you met? Uh, I remember Michelle? when I met him. And I was in high school. And I was in the 11th grade. And I had taken on a job working at a cafe, Richmond's Cafe on Main Street. But I was a farmer. I picked cotton every day. I was my daddy's best cotton picker. I picked 400 pounds of cotton a day. And I could pick more than my brother. And I loved it, my dad. I loved it for him to come to the cotton patch where we were because he worked it in the cotton patch and my mother also worked in the cotton patch. We farmed it. And we had moved to Dawson, Georgia, Terrell County. And he was still farming, but he moved in the city. My mother kept telling my daddy, James, you need to get something of your own. James, you need to get something of your own. So my mother went to work at a house where daddy was renting land from this white man, Frank Smith. The first year that we moved to this farm and daddy was farming with this white man, we did good. Daddy made a profit. That year he made that profit, the man that we was farming for found out that my daddy had said that that year he was going to buy him a home. So that year, daddy worked at that farm. The man took most of the farm and we come out, daddy made $600. He gave it to his wife, my mother. My mother went to town and she bought this home. They purchased this home. It was kind of shabby, but they bought it because we needed somewhere to stay because daddy was coming from the farm to come to town to do public work. And he started at the mill where they gin and cotton. And my mother went to the hospital as a dietitian cooking for the hospital. And at that time, when I went to work to get little items to buy for school, because we loved at school and my mother and daddy loved for us to go to school. So when I got this little job, my husband came in from the military. I thought he told me he was a military boy. And I was walking home that evening from my job. And this car, Chevrolet, loud yellow and brown rolled up behind me. I kind of looked around and I saw this man in his car. He said, hey. I said, hey, hello, how you doing? He said, would you like a ride home? I looked at him. He had on his soldier uniform. I said, no. My mother do not allow me to ride with boys, plus the one in the military, because they don't do nothing but come home and get girls pregnant. So no. Mm -hmm. And so when I walked on, and he rode on slowly. He asked me where I live. He rode slowly behind me until I got home. And then he found out where I lived, and he asked me, could he come visit me? I said, yeah, you can come visit me. So he started visiting me, and he was coming so regular, too regular. I said, don't you think you need to slow down? Come on, mama, don't want me to coat every day, because I have children that we had to milk them cows and get their milk and bring in children from the wood and have a fire. So he did start coming, you know, in the evening, and he would stay from maybe I said seven to nine. And when nine come, I start looking at that clock. My mother don't allow us to have no company no later than nine o'clock. When nine o'clock come, that boy had to be out of there. So he would come and he would stay to nine. And he left. And he came about a year. 
and then he asked me to marry him. I was in the 12th grade, and we got married in June 57, and my aunt had told me that when I graduated from high school, she wanted me to go to beautician because that's what I liked. I liked doing hair. So she told me, when you get out, just go into school. I said, yes, ma'am. I'll be glad to go to college for cosmetology. So he wanted to marry me, and I had told him what my aunt said. I couldn't marry because I had to go to, to school, to college, and my aunt was going to pay for it. So he told my mother and my father that he would pay for me going to school for cosmetology if he would marry me. So he did, we got married in June 57, and I came home, we had, after two years, we started having our children. I had, my first was a girl, Beverly, my second was a boy, Lucia Jr., my third was a girl, Charlene, and my fourth was my baby, Patrick, and that was in 64. So he was going to military school, so he paid for me to go to cosmetology at Albany Tech College at that time. And I went for beautiful culture. And I graduated with a master cosmetologist license. And I started my business. And he built a business for me to do hair. And I was a very successful beautician to help him raise our children because he was fired from the post office because he was involved with voter stretching movement. He was, he, was, he was in the movement with SCLC, and he was uh, getting people registered to vote. So if we voted, registered, and voted, we would not have such a hard time because the white people didn't want you to register and vote because they wanted to keep you down so you would be enslaved in the cotton patches and cone patches and doing all that stuff. So that was the reason why he was working so hard so we could get people registered where they could better themselves and get good educations so we wouldn't have to do all this stuff that we doing and being dogged out and punished and beating and dragging up and down the streets and all of that kind of stuff. And so I went and I got finished and got my license and started doing hair. But when I started to doing hair, the people, they didn't like that too well because they knew the white people had told them that don't fool around with the Holloway because bad thing was going on in their home, getting people's registered vote. And y'all don't need to register, and y'all don't need to vote. Y'all need to stay just like y'all is, dumb. So my custom was limited. But we didn't pay that in attention. I just kept on doing and kept on working and kept on going to the um, SCLC um, organizations that they had what he was involved with until it got real, real crucial as we stayed in it. He was threatened. They took the gas tank from our house, the coldest night that we had with our baby. We, I was there and it was just getting cold. That was the coldest night in that year. In 59, when my first child come. And it was cold and I had the baby laying on my lap. And he said, it was cold. I said, Lucia, it's cold in this house. He said, I just filled the tank up with gas, had the people to bring the gas out here. I said, but ain't no gas in there cause the, the coal's still getting dark and dark. And he went out and looked. Those white people had come there and cut that gas line loose from our house and left. And we did not have no gas, it was cold. And a friend of ours that next day had a, a old time heater that you could put kerosene in it. So she let us use that kerosene heater until we could get to get some heat. And it was hard for my husband to get out and get heat and stuff like that at that time. So somebody lent him a, a coal heater. They had to cut a hole through the house to put a, a wooden heater in there for us to get the wood to put in there to have heat for a while. 
Then it went on, we went to the, um, kept going to the movements and things. They told him, he went to work one day, he was working at the post office. They said, well, he didn't have no job down no more. And they told him he didn't have no job. They said that he had um, over, put more time down than he was supposed to have to get a chance to fire him, but he hadn't did that. But that's what they did to get him fired from that job. So they got him fired. So then after they got him fired from that job, he kept still getting people registered to vote. He still, he didn't give up. He just still was fighting for the rights of getting people registered and vote. And this night that I knew that we was going to die, I just felt it, that we was going to be killed this particular night. Um, he came home and he said that he was going to that meeting that night. And those white people, the white people that an old lady worked for in our community, she cooked it for those people. And those people told her that they was gonna kill Lucius Holloway that night because they tired of that mess of he getting people registered and voted and, and these niggas don't need to be no registered, no vote, they need to stay like they is. And she come down there and she told, she begged him, she said, Holloway, please don't go to the meeting tonight. She said, please don't go to this meeting tonight. Lucius said, Miss Ozadale, he said, I gotta go. So she said, all right, I said, um, I don't warn you. So they're going to get rid of you tonight. So that night around 7 o'clock, my husband come in. He told me, y'all get rid of Everywhere my husband went, I don't know why he wanted to kill me and I'm chilling with him. He dragged us to go. But I think that was to have more spirit. He, he had his standard with him. He was covered, you know, the spirit. But he didn't realize that God had his back, had on his back. And we went on that night to this church to call Mount Olive Baptist Church in South of Georgia. I had them four kids sitting with me on this bench in the church. And we went in that church. Um, it was some boys on the outside. And one of the boys knocked on the one and said, Miss Holloway, so don't sit side of that one. She said, cause these people out here, they said they gonna ride and they were gonna kill tonight. And my husband, I had a friend that he had been in the military. And he came to that movement meeting that night. And when he came, he got to my husband. And he said, Lucia said, I don't hear about they're gonna kill y'all tonight. I was just as nervous and scared as I could be, but I didn't I just said whatever happened got to happen. So he told my husband, he said, You give me your key, your car key. He said, You take my car. And when you leave him, you go the way for safety. I'm gonna take your car and I'm gonna go back the way you came. So that young man with Hershey Blasher, he gave Lucius that car. Those people come in at night at church, they raised that church, they had guns, had them cop to shoot everybody, the Sherrod, Charles Sherrod and them, the SCLC movement people, they were there that night too, all of them. And the way we were saved, we got in this car and we went the other way around, the long way around. And when this young man got in our car and went back the way we came from Dawson by the creek, the police and all just a gang that was sitting down there waiting to shoot and kill us. And when they got there, they would throw these flashlights in these men's face, in this young man's face in our car. He said, you ain't the nigga I'm looking for. I'm looking for that Lucia Holloway. We're going to kill him tonight. And said, where is he is? You hiding him. He said that he had to go pick up some flyers for a meeting. Some flyers for a meeting. And he said, yes, yes, sir. And so they harassed him because he figured that they had outsmarted us and we was in a car, but they didn't have no way of knowing. They just took what the man said. And we came on around through the um, backside of Lee County. It took us about <laughs> like three hours to get to our house, and it would have took about 30 minutes to get there otherwise. But we were safe that night. They didn't kill us that night. The next week or two, they came to the house, and my husband always sent me to answer the door. This a man came to kill him that night. 
And when I went to the door, the door somebody knocked on the door and he said, go to the door. And we would just be real still and go and peep out. And that night I peeped out, this man had come to kill him. But he wouldn't answer no door, and I peeped out and I saw this man kneeling down at our door, and nobody said that. And we went back in the house, and I told him about this man was out here. So we just got still. Some of us went up on the bed, carried the children up on the bed, and we just paced there. And the next day, when he got up and went to the post office, I think that the next day, the same man was round there to kill him. But the man said later that he just couldn't kill it. And he went on and moved out of town because I think the white folk run him out of there because he, couldn't, he didn't kill my husband. And thank God we still alive. His story is along the mind. Hmm. But some of mine, <laughs> I could remember and some of it I not, didn't because I was just so scared and so frightened about what happened just because we wanted to register and vote, but we could better ourselves and help people in the community as we did. But we still hope people in our community, we still there and we still helping people. And I thank God for all of this because it's all about him, not me. And let me fast forward real fast to pick up on that. Uh, Emma Kate didn't tell you, she gave me an ultimatum. She said, uh, you got to do two things before I marry. You got to get out the army, number one, and I didn't want to do that. Number two, help me through school, but I give them up. But after I, that was sometime in 55, it was just a few days later, I met uh, three men on a conversation, Adonette with D.U. Pullum and M.J. Hall, and, and of course, I was, we was introduced to each other. And on this spot in 1955, the president of the NAACP appointed me his first vice president, 1955, a position that I have been in ever since. Now he got, he got, no, he got beat up to die, but he died from it. That may be the interim president for a little while. So we got another man, uh, J.L. Bond, for president. I fell back to first vice president. He served faithful for several years, and he got killed right in the office, right in the office, killed dead. I served at an interim until he was buried and got, so as we speak, uh, uh, Ezekiel Holly is the president of the NAACP. I'm still first vice president. I've been since 1955. But you know, all, it was all about the vote. The whole thing was about the vote. So I stayed on course despite all of the threats I had on my life. I stayed on the course, I filed all the lawsuits, black men and black women, they backed off. And in Dawson, I would be told any time, if I was walking down the street and some black folks met me, they would run on the other side because they said, when well, them black folks shoot you, I don't want to get shot. So if, if I would walk up in the church or on the crowd, they would, they would just get away from me. So I was just like a soap finger standing up there by myself. But as my wife said, I never stopped, I never give it up. And, and it all wasn't no easy nights and days. I was just as scared as any other human. I was human, but I went along with it. And I had a couple of black men to, to sh was paid to shoot me. Well, I said paid, maybe they wasn't, but they was told to because they said they were. But I, I never was shot. I lived through it. And as a result, after filing the lawsuits and all this kind of thing in Terror County, we uh, were able to get black folks elected to positions, we were able to get black folks appointed to positions, and as we speak right now, we pretty much dominate the electorate in the city of Dawson and Terrell County. We got black folks in all uh, phases of elected positions, and some of them is kind of in the leadership. We had a, a black man elected mayor for about 20 plus, 22 plus years, and uh, of course, he got comfortably, got too comfortable and too selfish. We voted him out the other day. We got a young 22-year-old black man for our mayor, and we're very happy for him. And I served four years on the city council. I'm rather to my 17th and a half year on the Board of County Commissioners. 
and I'm on every board that is, and, 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 and every organization that's worth anything, and I tell them all the time, one time back in the mid 60s, I tried to join the Ku Klux Klan, but they wouldn't <laughs> let me. So I'm really saying that I was a part of everything, and it went in a selfish way. You know, I did it to help the people. I've always, from nine years old, as far back as I can remember, I always had a desire to help people. I always thought it was a better way and a better time. And being in the military, I could see things different in other states and cities. I could see people's doing a little bit better than they were in Terrell County. And I said, if you can do it in South Carolina, if you can do it in Maryland, if you can do it in Korea, if you can do it in Amman, Jerry, and if you can do it in Bandria, Spain, you can do it in Dawson. So I stayed on it. And, and I'm very uh, uh, humble and I'm very excited and thankful to God that a lot of things that I worked for some 57, 58 years ago, I'm seeing it into fruition. And, and it's time, if you'd ask me, would you see it? I said, no, but it will happen. But I'm actually seeing it. And, and it's amazing to wake up every morning and see things that 55, 56 years ago that I was struggling for. Men's has died right in Terrell County trying to do the same thing. And I got an article over there entitled The Last Man Standing. And when you read through the whole article, and they say that man is Lucius Holloway. Because it was four of us, three of them dead, two of them got killed, one died naturally. And of course, I'm the last man standing. I don't know how I'll go. I might die naturally, I might get shot. Or I just don't know, but right now I'm the last man standing that ever did anything big for Terrell County. There was a few people come in later on and did something, but they was just like rabbits. They hopped about the bed and run. Some of them even left the state, and then some of them gradually come, left the city, and some of them gradually come back. We had set about two families left the state, and we had any number of them left the city, and they gradually come back and everything gets smoothed off, and the plane had got up to 40,000 feet, and he had to set on cruise, and then, uh, uh, students said, unbuckle your belts, they come back. <laughs> they, they come back. <laughs> so, so uh, but I'm very humble, I'm very happy, and I'm very blessed to even just to sit here now and talk about it. And for the past few years, I've been from place to place. Uh, I even wrote a book, The Civil Rights Through the Eyes of Lucius Holloway. And of course, I had about five or six of them this morning, and they all went fast than somebody knew I had them. But I, yeah, I wrote that book, and, and a lot of these things we're talking about is in there. And I'm just, as I said, I'm humbled, I'm blessed, and thankful that I'm able to see you. Let me just ask you one, one last question. What would you like children, the younger generation today, to know about what you all went through over the years, but really during the height of the movement uh, in, in the 60s? I would like for them to know that my family, although I was the spokesman, I was the one doing everything, but they were there. So that's just like they were saying what I'm going to say. I would like for the young children, boys and girls, to know today, number one, trust in God for what you want and stay focused. If you believe in it, stay with it. I would like for them to know that. And when they know that, then they will begin to achieve. I would like for them to know that. Mrs. Holloway, mm -hmm. same thing. What would you like the children of today, young people of today, to know about what you uh, went through during the movement? I would like for the young people today is to know that they can make a difference. Mm -hmm. If they be obedient, respect the elder and respect themselves and try to get a good education and stay in school and be honorable to themselves because you got to respect yourself mm -hmm. before you go anywhere. Respect themselves and education is the key to being successful from the womb to the lap, from the laps to toddlers. Training and listen and obeying, and they will make it and trust God. 
Mr. Holloway, Mrs. Holloway, thank you so much for sharing your story. Welcome. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.